There's basically two wings that used to be called right wing and left wing. Right. Honestly, in our country, according to modern context, which I feel is the peak of any context, right. uh, it's actually pro-Modi government, anti-Modi government. Right, right. Okay? Right. right. Uh, the pro-Modi has exactly what you said, Indic. Every, anyone who is Indic is also mostly pro-Modi because of the geopolitical scenarios of today in terms of there's no other leader in the country who'd be able to take on China, America, Europe. There is an like. overlap. It's not ideal. As in? the sense okay okay not all indic fans are modi fans exactly all right we'll, we'll break that down right uh the left is a lot of urban elite when i go for fancy parties it's always some one who studied abroad who right. will uh even tell me bro you're too right wing in my heart personally i do feel i'm a fence sitter because for me according to what i learned through media over eight years is that it is important to a certain degree for a media professional mm. to constantly be a fence sitter and if there's an extreme pro Modi or extreme anti Modi person, keep pulling them back to the center just right. in order to extract more information and more learning. So I feel I constantly make an effort to sit on the center. And that's exactly where I am right now. Very open to having my perspectives shaken. Okay. Coming back to the extreme left, lots of anti Modi stuff, right. lots of urban elite, uh, lots of people in the world of history, which is a little strange, which I mean, archaeologists, uh, people who are spokespersons for history, etc. Um, I would say all the religions other than Hinduism, some of Sikhism, Jains and Buddhists. So Muslim, Christian primarily, some Sikhs are on that anti-Modi uh, right. side. Primarily because if you actually go and speak to them and I have a lot of Christian, Muslim, Sikh friends, uh, they do feel that their status as a minority or a status as an, a person of another religion is threatened because of the current government because of their whole CA, CAB thing, right, right. etc, etc, etc. Uh, they view Amit Shah and Modi as sort of versions of the devil. Right. Uh, they won't agree to a lot of the uh, pro-Modi uh, perspectives. Right. Uh, in fact, people on both the ends are shut completely to the other side. Often. Correct. Uh, this is the general youth picture. Correct. Now, would you correct me at any point like... See, there are two things. One is, a lot of people hate me for what I say. They have absolutely no personal equations with me whatsoever. So it's not as if I've done any personal harm or good for them to form an opinion one way or the other. So clearly, what are they hating? What I represent or what I stand for, at least what I claim to stand for. I would apply that logic to a significant extent to Mr. Modi. Most people don't know Mr. Modi on a first-hand basis. So what is it that they are hoping or what is it that they are actually channeling their anger towards? He, according to them, represents the crystallization of Hindutva at the highest level possible, political Hindutva, which is to say where state power is openly Hindu. Allow me to say this, and this is my biggest criticism both of the left as well as the government establishment. They are, first of all, not Hindu enough. These guys have made them look Hindu thanks to their criticism. Because the question that you should be asking is, if a particular government is either pro or anti, the test is what? Policy. Pro, what has it done? Pro or anti Hindu. Correct. Okay. So you should ask a question with the question is, what has it done for Hindus to say that he's pro Hindu? What has he done against Muslims for someone to say he's anti Muslim? That question is never asked. So it's empty opinions being aired in the form of angst. Without data or evidence. Because angst within media spreads faster? Faster. Any other reason? No. So one, angst. And two, it's lazy research. It's okay. hard work to actually pull out the data and ask some serious questions. Okay. Here's a simple example. There's a very popular video during the CA uh, protests or anti-CA protests. I think this was in Mumbai. Uh, Mr. Farhan Akhtar was participating in this, uh, in this protest. And the journalist asked... What is it about this legislation that you oppose? Explain. He had no clue. Not the first clue what the legislation was about. Not the first clue what it was meant to deliver. He said, Itne sare log pe hain, to kuch to kuch to hoga. So he's saying, I'm here because there are others shouting. That's exactly how communist marches used to take place in Kerala in the 60s and 70s. So a bystander near a tea stall would be drinking tea. Some idiot would be going uh, about taking a protest march saying, long live revolution, Viplav, and so on and so forth. This fellow will say, I will also join. Mm. <laughs> He'll never ask the first question. Is there a basis for it? What is my position on it? Nothing. 
I challenge most people who think they know anything about the CA to tell me what the CA is about. They won't be able to. You know what my next question is going to be. <laughs> yeah, sure. Explain it. So you see, CA has a historical context. But before I come to the long-winded historical context, I'll give the straight answer. What does it do? Previously, for a refugee from Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan, if they wanted to apply for citizenship in this country, there were a certain set of criteria that they had to satisfy. Cut-off dates, documents, how many years they've actually lived in Bharat for them to say that they intend to live in Bharat for the rest of their lives. That period was about 11 years. That was reduced. To say, you don't need to live here for 11 years to claim or ask for citizenship. That's one. And second is, it basically says in these countries, there is a marked anti-non-Muslim persecution where non-Muslim minorities don't seem to be having a great time at all. And the demographics are fast dwindling. And with each passing day, there's a serious problem. Now, when they, when they act on that and they come out with a CA, the first question that people ended up asking is, will Indian Muslims be affected by it? A specific amendment to the Citizenship Act, which is meant to facilitate faster acquisition of citizenship to refugees, uska bhartiya musalmanu ke saath kya lena dena hai? Ask yourself this simple commonsensical question. Show me one provision from that amendment which deprives an Indian Muslim of his right to citizenship. It doesn't, it doesn't deal with that at all. Target audience bahar ka hai. Aap andar ke logon ko yaan pe uksa rahe I think the question is, why not just apply it on the refugees and not the Muslims already living here? Very clear answer to that. In the backdrop of the two nation theory still active and kicking, with partition having, let's say, it, uh, played itself out on a religious basis, I have no reason to trust a Pakistani Muslim. I have no reason to trust a Bangladeshi Muslim. Okay, Pakistan was partitioned with a bloody partition in 1971. Okay. Did Bangladesh say we will now merge back with India? No. So the premise of the partition, which is two-nation theory that Hindus and Muslims cannot live together, continues to be the premise for the existence of Bangladesh. Otherwise, they would have marched back. We celebrate what? Oh, common Bangladeshi culture, Bangla culture, language, sari, food and all that. None of that played a role, right? So therefore, we are very clear about the fact that I, I don't need to extend the very same benefit of doubt that I give to the Indian Muslim, to Pakistani Muslims or Bangladeshi Muslims under any circumstances. Then people said, what about Ahmadiyas? They are not seen as Muslims. Are bhai, at least thoda to history padlo. Ahmadiyas were among the foremost proponents of creation of Pakistan. You asked for it. Why should we end up inviting you back? You'll come back here and create the same trouble that you did when you were with us. Please go to their website of Ahmadiyya Pakistan. Their website categorically boasts that we are among the founding communities of Pakistan and today we are being ill-treated here. So an internal feud between Ahmadiyya Muslims and non-Ahmadiyya Muslims doesn't change the fact that you opted for a particular decision in 46 and 47, 1946 and 47. Why should I change my position? Maybe because the grandparents opted for it. You're telling me that the Ahmadiyya community continues or at least has no anti-Hindu and anti-India animus today? Wouldn't that be at least the, let's say, shouldn't that be the subject of a basic study to find out what is their position today? Okay, let's ask, uh, let's ask this question. Hindus and Ahmadiyyas are persecuted by the Punjabi Sunni majority of Pakistanis, of Pakistan, okay? Did Ahmadiyyas ever find it in themselves to create an alliance with Hindus and say, both of us are commonly affected. Let's speak up for each other. No. The Ahmadiyyas continue to spew venom against Hindus in Pakistan. Okay. So, if 80% of this country is Hindu, assuming, I mean, let's see, Naya census kya kehta hai, we don't know, it can be less than that. Why should I endanger the life of 80% of this country by inviting people merely to say, I too am secular, I too am humanitarian. Mujhe isa boli ki nahi hai. Okay. My national interest and civilizational interest comes first. Okay. Everything else is secondary. What's the reality of CA today in 2023? The unfortunate reality, which is why I said that <clears throat> Indic interest and BJP interest overlapping is just a happy coincidence. It's not 100% overlap. The rules have, have not been notified till date. At the very least, to the best of my limited knowledge and decent memory, six extensions have been sought from the parliament to come out with the rules to implement the CA. 
तो आपने सी ए तो लॉन्च कर दिया बट आपने रूल्स के बारे में सोचा ही नहीं था माई क्वेश्चन इज तो तैयारी किस लेवल की है वॉट इज द लेवल ऑफ यूर प्रिपरेशन एंड इन द प्रोसेस द एंटायर कंट्री इज डिस्कसिंग एन इश्यू विच द गवर्नमेंट हैज नॉट शोन द इंटरेस्ट टू इम्प्लीमेंट येट मे बी बिकॉज ऑफ द बैकलाश इट गोट इन विच केस आई वुड देन से वॉट स्ट्रॉन्ग गवर्नमेंट फार्म प्रोटेस्ट रोल बैक सी ए यू हैवन डन दिस खालिस्तानी मूवमेंट हैज बी नॉर्मलाइज एंड समन मैनेज टू टेक आउट अ ट्रैक्टर परेड ऑन द ट्वेंटी सिक्स ऑफ जनवरी ओके राइट द ट्राइकल वॉज पुल्ड ऑफ ऑल ऑफ दिस इज हैपन्ड Punjab is again <coughs> looking at a situation where it may not be exactly the 1980s but it seems like it is hurtling towards it then i have to say what strong government this is exactly where my disagreements come and my criticisms come so the good part is that i am not part of a choir which is constantly singing in praise of anyone okay i am clearly saying give credit where it's due okay all right but also disagree and point out the mistakes okay cool i i heard like everything you said and uh, i'm going to give some of my own perspective here and please correct me wherever you think i'm going wrong sure. okay this is from the perspective of extracting even more information right uh, and i'm also going to go one layer deep and say two things right the one thing i've learned over my career is that data is the new oil if you follow data and if you follow facts and figures you will get growth which is true and at some points in this whole journey with data i notice that no at some point you have to trust your intuition with certain decisions also Correct. in terms of what is the human angle of this etc etc uh which has led to some very good decisions in my own career right. so i've begun to trust a, a version of data meets intuition that's one thought perfect the second thing i'd like to bring in is that we had a, a tibetan monk on the show recently who explained buddhism to me okay buddhism has a lot of similarities with hinduism and the more you kind of go to the depths of buddhism you realize oh this is very similar to us he said that the one difference that he feels is buddhism is centered first and foremost around altruistic thought hmm. which means that when they say om mani padme hum hmm. you're praying for the welfare of every sentient being hmm. including animals including whales including right. fish including insects right. including humans of other faiths right that stayed with me a lot after all these podcasts we recorded right and i feel i've become even more empathetic since i've started chanting since i met him right. because every podcast rubs off a certain energy okay uh which again makes me think that even with a decision like this my opinion is that you should include some amount of intuition and see what the overall effects on the morale of mm. the overall country are right and while maybe see I'll, i'll never be able to argue with you as a lawyer about you know keeping facts and figures in mind you can I don't want to. <laughs> But uh, uh, I'm not a journalist, dude. Right. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a podcaster. I'm right. also learning. Right. Right. What I will say is that you're the most. Uh, I mean, I hate using the word because you don't like it. But you're the most right person I've uh, uh, had on the show. Like no right. one has come on the show till now and said, "No, the government's not doing enough." Correct. <laughs> like you're the first person who's sort of pro Modi, but is also pulling right. it further in that direction. Everyone is. kind of on the central side some right my point is maybe i've learned this through business and through managing human beings right that even morale is a thing within the country right and i'm also keeping present geopolitical scenarios in mind right. uh you would have genghis khan right so i mean why the fuck am i asking you that? <laughs> so, <laughs> genghis khan right uh grew up in mongolia right where he was at war with other mongolian tribes right his until, wife was kidnapped sorry his wife was kidnapped yeah. right he he saw a lot of atrocity because of the local civil wars where tribes used to face each other right eventually when he took over the country he knew that there's still going to be wars there right. was a sort of inherent divide and rule mentality there as well right so he said that no instead of fighting with each other hmm. let's coagulate let's become one and then go out and conquer asia right. that's the power of bringing multiple human beings of multiple faiths and multiple subjective realities together right and giving an external kind of motive right the one thing i've learned about geopolitics is that it's very money driven so the richer you are as a country right. the more geopolitically powerful you are correct the world <clears throat> is sort of beginning to be at war constantly now right we need to first develop our armor we need to develop our weaponry for which we need to become rich for right. which the morale of the country has to be good right. for which my opinion is that mohammed siraj should be in the same team that shikhar dhawan bats for agreed so that's why i'm not fully in agreement with you right but please correct me so it's like this 
one of the finest human beings that i've had the good fortune of engaging with is shri kk mohammad hmm. okay and my regret is i could not interact with shri abdul kalam these are examples that i'm very comfortable with and these are people who i genuinely feel warm towards okay shri kk mohammad notwithstanding his name is among the few people who renovated temples the bateshwar temple in madhya pradesh when he was with the asi and someone who was upfront and candid about the impact of islamic invasions in bharat okay to my mind that's honesty where in the current generation is not carrying the baggage of the past you say somebody may have done it i don't agree with it and i don't wish to relate to it in any way the problem is those who seek association with the conqueror of the past are making the conqueror an existing reality of the present okay and that's where the problem starts okay then the wounds fester so you're saying muslims are chill as long as they have indian identity intact in their hearts today right. but you should, shouldn't celebrate things like mughal invasions or uh, you know the whole the kind of shit we taught in history books this is not me saying actually so i have several disagreements again with dr ambedkar but one of the uh, finest things that he has said in pakistan or partition of india in the opening chapters he is asking the basic question what makes a nation a nation he starts with the theoretical basis and then asks whether india is two nations within one can it survive as a single nation because he is writing this in 1946 when pakistan has become a reality okay so he is asking this question congress is trying desperately to say no we can represent both interests muslim league says sorry not happening ambedkar is asking congress to get real and he says you have never existed as a single nation hindus and muslims so please don't kid yourself and he speaks in perhaps as politically incorrect a language as possible from today's terms or from today's perspective and he's bloody clear about this he says what do you define as a nation is you have common heroes common villains which is in group ka definition bhi common hai out group ka definition bhi common hai who belongs to us and who doesn't both these definitions are crystal clear and you have a largely shared vision of the future but if you don't have a shared vision of the past kahe ka rahega bhai future right until 1920s nobody thought that there would be a partition of bharat there was increasing clamor but it's only after khilafat it started really taking a lot it, it started getting a lot of traction because the beast had been unleashed which mm. was waiting for an opportunity okay mm. so when all of this exists i am asking myself what part of this position extreme or non extreme is different is a historic or lacks basis in history okay. or in lived experience okay. that's one two i am 100% with you given the geopolitics the increasingly volatile geopolitics of the world where interestingly bharat is poised to play a good role right why would you want to create trouble within well i don't want to i'm i'm not interested in it at all anyone who is doing well for himself or herself has zero interest in creating trouble because peace makes it all possible mm. right it's not as if i need trouble for me to thrive you're saying the media has fueled these hindutva fear narratives which muslims and christians and minorities have adopted therefore there's a lack of peace media is just one convenient punching bag i significantly blame and squarely blame the left okay which is all the people who meet at parties college kids the academics mm. the marxists specifically the marxists yeah. their historiography and their al- alignment of interests has always been with the worst of examples from the non hindu communities not with the good examples the left never celebrated dr kalam as long as he was alive the left till date does not celebrate shri kk mohammad because he was clear about the position of ram janmabhoomi because as an asi director he knew what he was talking about the evidence was in was speaking to him right so i have always said this remove the left from the conversation between the hindus and muslims you'll have a much more honest conversation okay because the left feels demonization or other feeds demonization and the left also feeds victimization mm. it happens at both ends fair what's the future of muslims and christians in india i would say that 
Kerala Muslims today have realized that their safety lies in having a significant Hindu population so that they can survive without any trouble. Safety? Yes. Kerala Christians have realized this because they are seeing the increasing radicalization of Kerala. For the first time in several decades, uh, Christian pastors have clearly said, we need to have Hindu neighbors. If I had said this, I'd be accused of all sorts of things. Well, they're saying this. And they're basically saying that the grooming that's happening is not limited only to the Hindu community that's happening even within the Christian community. The kind of grooming that you see of Pakistani gangs in, in UK, that's something that's being replicated in Kerala. I would use the word sexual grooming and religiously profiled sexual grooming. Right? Sexual grooming? Yes. You mean they're seducing Hindu girls? I would say there is a very clear uh, data. And recently the retired, uh, uh, let's say, cop from Madhya Pradesh, who's a Sikhni for that matter, ended up making the statement that I've seen this as part of my own career, that there were rate cards being distributed as to what is the price of a particular girl or what is the price of securing a particular girl. This is commoditization of women. It should actually be a priority for feminists. Right? So the point is, safety of Bharat or the way forward is in preserving its accommodating character. And that character will be preserved only if it remains Hindu majority. Okay. And you have reason to believe it's not going to remain Hindu majority. I have no reason to believe one way or the other. I just know for a fact that in at least uh, over 100 districts out of 775 districts, there is a very clear demographic imbalance. I've hinted at the importance of, not hinted, I've spoken of it, of the importance of demographic balance in the second book, where I showed the populations of each of the provinces and which are the provinces which are actively batting for Pakistan. It's a game of population and numbers. Okay. Because you're a lawyer and an engineer, I'm, saying, I'm assuming that everything you're saying is backed on like research, facts. The tables figures. from that particular period, the census of that particular period, captures the total population in each in each province and the Muslim population in each province. I have cited this. I have not generated data. I have captured the data from existing primary authentic sources. Okay. Okay. And you. so far, the book was launched on the 23rd of August, 2022. No one has been able to counter me on facts. Okay. One last question in this segment. What do you see as the way forward? Bharatiya Karan of our thought processes. Which is, as uh, Dr. Ambedkar said, if conversion to a different faith has the consequence of alienating you from your own roots and from Bharat, then it poses a significant threat to the long-term interests of Bharat. So, we are told that there is this mythical creature called Indian Islam. I am saying let it become a reality. We are all safe. Okay. I am saying let Ganga Jamani Tehzeeb which is constantly spewed and spouted on. Let it become a reality. This takes nothing away from practices of Islam, like going to the masjid, no, doing namaz. No, no, no. Those are perfectly fine. See, But you're saying just accept uh, history in the same way that many Hindus accept history today. There are three requirements. One, okay. accept the fact <clears throat> that neither of these Abrahamic faiths are native to Bharat. And the culture of this land is significantly informed by its native faith systems. And therefore, also be slightly more empathetic or sympathetic. Empathy is not possible because you're not in the same position. Sympathetic to the fact that this is an imposed faith. Because at the end of the day, a lot of them are converts. That is a reality. Now, whether they want to come back or not, I don't think it's, it should be a matter of imposition or coercion. That should be left to people's choice. That should be left to their own free will. However, it shouldn't come to a point where the native faith system is struggling to find gasps of breath. Okay. So, Mr. Vajpayee's ashes were refused cremation or they weren't, uh, they weren't allowed to be, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, immersed in rivers in the northeast. Because the majority communities in the northeast said, sorry, this can't happen. This is anti-Christian or un-Christian. So in Bharat, you can't immerse ashes of your former prime minister. And you're telling me that's okay? Mm. 
think about it right why should the death of a mafia uh, don result in victimization or perceived victimization of the community to which apparently this man relates to or uh, is, mm. is is from okay. what kind of elements are you really celebrating mm. there are better, better examples pop culture academia politics there are better people surely it can't be our argument that this is the best possible example to be held up as role models mm. 